Molly, we're back for the third week in a row. Can you believe it? Well, two weeks, but this is our third session already. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. The the technology gods have allowed us to come together and have another conversation. Another conversation, either much to the delight of our audience or maybe not so much delight, but if they wasn't delightful, they probably wouldn't be watching or listening. I mean, the truth is, as long as you and I have a conversation where we both learn something, I'll take that as a win. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned learning something today because I'm definitely going to learn something because today, so just to review for everybody, they haven't listened to this. Um, week one, Molly talked a lot about Myers-Briggs mm-hmm. and we figured out that Molly and I are quite opposite in some ways, which you probably already knew. Um, last week, I covered off on DISC. And this week we're going to cover out so like the of the th- four of these. These are the one. This is the one that I know the least about. I've taken it, but we're going to cover off in the Enneagram today. And I know this is also a very very popular assessment. You see, I see a lot of things about Enneagram and wings and numbers and all sorts of things. So I'm going to grill you on this because I don't know much about it other than I've had like I've had an hour and a half session on my own Enneagram. Okay. But I don't know. I don't know the philosophy behind it. I don't know where it was created. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I love it. I'm super excited. And then let's let's look forward. Next week we have one more session. You're going to take the lead on that. Yes. And most people would know that as kind of the strengths finder. It'd be the name they would know it by. I think it's Clifton Strengths is kind of the yeah uh, the official name. But strengths finder might be what a lot of people know that as. Yeah. Well, it's it's strange because, and I'll talk about this next week. There's a books like Strength Finder, Strength Finder 2.0, and for whatever reason, Gallup, who owns who owns the you know the the IP behind it, they renamed it to Clifton Strengths. So I'm like, mm-hmm. well, that's weird because everybody knows. Oh, like, oh, have you ever taken Strengths Finder? They're like, yeah, I've taken Strengths Finder. Oh, have you ever taken Clifton Strengths? They're like, I don't know what that is. So I'm not, I'm not sure in marketing who made that decision, but that's for next week. Yeah. So this week, we're gonna go right into the Enneagram. So first things first, what is the Enneagram assessment? Yeah. So I think this is interesting that we're having this conversation in the third session, because as you got to know me a little bit better through Myers-Briggs and through DISC, what I'm about to tell you is not going to surprise you at all, because you know that I am a thinker. I'm an internal processor. I like to like, let's get some more research. Let's get some more data. There's got to be more out there. And so it's always interesting for me to have a conversation about the Enneagram. Like, I always feel like I need to preface this. Everything I know about the Enneagram, I was self-taught on. Mm-hmm. Unlike Myers-Briggs, where I was like, sign me up for that five-day course. I want to learn everything possible. The Enneagram is a little bit different. It is an open source assessment. So there are lots of people that offer certifications, lots of people that offer assessments, um, lots of free assessments. And I, and I want to give some suggestions today of resources that I have found helpful, websites that I have found helpful, because I think one of the challenges with the Enneagram is if you went online and just typed in free Enneagram assessment, you're going to be overwhelmed with some not so great options. And so I'd like to steer people. Yeah, I think there are, there's a point where you've watered it down too far. You've made it too simple. And, uh, and there's a lot of that. And I think a lot of people are having maybe a negative experience with the Enneagram because they didn't get anything out of it. They're like, I took this assessment. It didn't tell me anything. So I'd love to steer people in the right direction. But I share all of that because I too am learning about this assessment. Um, I've been studying it for probably between four and five years now. And I feel like I have just cracked the surface. (laughs) Like there's so much in this assessment. So I'm going to share what I've learned and hopefully that's helpful for people. So the the Enneagram seems to be a tool that's really popular right now. You hear a lot of people talking about, there's kind of a a cultural coolness that's associated with the Enneagram. So if you want in the cool club, the Enneagram is where it is at right now. Well, you know and, that, you know, I always want to be in the cool club. So you're speaking my language. All right. You, you got to join. You got to be all in on this. So I had seen the Enneagram um, on books or on websites. I had seen the diagram of it. And it's, yeah. it's a circle with nine numbers. And you see all of these lines, kind of like a spider web. Yeah. And I always saw that like at my favorite used bookstore. And I thought that just looks too mystical for me. I don't know what that's about. And it wasn't until about 
four or five years ago, I heard Ian Cron speak on the Enneagram and I was all in like, sign me up. I've got to learn about this tool. And he was able to talk about it in a way that just made sense to me. So it is a tool that's been around for a long, 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 long time. Um, It's been a little hard to trace the roots of who started it, where did it start, but it has had this resurgence in the last few years. A lot lot of groups have kind of said like, there's some validity behind this. Let's get a marketing campaign together. Let's figure out how we're going to talk about the Enneagram because I think a lot of people like me saw it and thought, I don't don't know what that is. I'm just going to move on to the next thing. So it's been a powerful tool for me. Let me start with one of the things that I think is different. Let me give you two things that I think are Honestly, different. Molly, before, you, before you go any further, can I ask um, is a question for my own curiosity? Mm-hmm. I understand the gram part of the word. What does Enya mean? Does it actually mean anything? Because gram would be like a polygram or it's like right. a shape, right? So it's, it's right. referring to the shape of it. But the Enya is just, it may mean something, it may not. Yeah, exactly. I okay. don't know. That's a good, for someone who loves research, let me add that to my yeah, list. Yeah, why don't you put that on your tea list? You'll be like, I'll be back in four to five hours with a comprehensive list. I will. There's going to be a week five where I want to talk about the things that I And I'll be like, I Molly, learned. I just want an answer to my question so we can move on. You'll be like, no, 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 but I need to give you these details. I'll be like. <laughs> yep, that's where it's headed. I can guarantee nice. it. I love it. I love it. I, I was just curious and hit me. I'm like, oh, I don't even know what any of means. Yeah. Like it, it, Cause it's not really, I don't know that it's common English language. Maybe it is. No, and I wonder if it has something to do with the number nine. Cause there's nine numbers in it. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. We need to figure this out. I think I'm probably, while you're speaking, I'm going to multitask and uh, cause you know, that's what I'm, I'm actually going to Google it and see what it means. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Where were we? A um, couple of things that are different about the Enneagram. So the Enneagram requires you to do a lot of work to figure out where you land on these, this circle of nine numbers. So unlike what we talked about with Myers-Briggs or with DISC, you take an assessment and the assessment tends to come back with some nice graphics and says, this is where you landed. This is you. And granted, we talked about with both of those assessments, what you put in is what you get out. There, there's some gray space there of what's your mindset like? What were you thinking about? What was your stress level like that might influence those questions? But both of those assessments give you a pretty good indicator of here's what we think you're saying about yourself. When you take the Enneagram assessment uh, with a good assessment, not the cheapest of the cheap free online versions, but, but, but a good version of it, it's going to come back and say kind of like, hey, Here's some trends we see in you. Now you go do your work and figure out where you land. So I think some people struggle with the Enneagram because they would rather you just tell me what I am. Yeah. But what I love about the Enneagram is it says, here's some stuff that surfaced for you. Now go do your homework and see what resonates for you. So for example, when I took the assessment, there were three numbers on the Enneagram that really kind of separated themselves from the rest of the pack. And number one, five and eight surfaced a little bit more for me. So I read all the chapters on being a one and I thought, wow, there's a lot in here that I get. This makes sense to me. Yeah. And I did the same thing with the eight. I'm like, oh yeah, there's some stuff in here that makes sense. Maybe not quite as much, but, but makes sense. And then I read the description of the five and it was like game over. That's me. That's, that's me. So I share that on the front end because it's really important for people that are interested in the Enneagram to not just print out this PDF and say, that's me, I'm done. You've really got to be involved in this process. You you have to figure out what really resonates with you. Now, the other piece that I found to be a really different experience with the Enneagram is with Myers-Briggs, I would carry the INTJ flag. I don't have any tattoos, but you know, if I had a, a temporary tattoo of INTJ, I'm proud of that. I'm good with that. With the Enneagram, my experience was very different. While I agreed with everything that the description of the five said, it also felt like I just got punched in the heart. Like, yeah, that's me. And I'm not always proud of that piece of me, or I wish that piece of me wasn't so prevalent, or I wish I could delete that part of me. 
And I've heard that from a lot of people who've taken the Enneagram. It's like, yeah, that's me. And oh, I got some stuff I got to really deal with. And it, it's a little bit more of a, I think a reality check of this is who you are. This is how you show up in the world. This is your center of gravity. And we all have, I don't even want to use the word good and bad, maybe more like uh, rough edges and smooth yeah. edges as we navigate the world, because it isn't just fives that say that. I have friends that are one, twos, or threes who all say like, oh, I figured out I'm a two and uh, it, it kind of sucks. I'm like, yeah, 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 no, I'm a five and it sucks too. <laughs> like it yeah. just shows you some of those rough edges. Well, that's interesting, Molly, because Myers-Briggs, DISC, and Clifton Strengths, the core philosophy is it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's all just who you are. And by the way, Enneagram, ancient Greek, Ennea, the number nine. So look yes. at you. you. Look at you, you T. All right. Deductive reasoning right Deductive there. Deductive okay. reasoning. Well, you okay. are an investigator. Number five is the investigator, right? <laughs> it's true. Um, it's true. But it's interesting. So it's interesting with the Enneagram. It actually does point out things that you could perceive as faults or flaws. The rest of these assessments don't do that. They don't say you stink at this thing or right. this is when you this is this is your ugly face like right. <laughs> this part of who you are so that's yeah. it. that's 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 what makes it a little more what i'm hearing it's 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 more um holistic as well absolutely yeah and yeah. one of the things that i find really interesting about the enneagram is for each of the nine numbers it will break down what it considers to be the nine levels of health so when we think about health we can look at our lives and say yeah, this was a healthy season for my life, or this was an unhealthy season. I was in a horrible job, horrible relationship, didn't like where I was living, unhealthy. But also throughout the day, we have moments of health and moments of, of being really unhealthy. So if I'm driving down the interstate and somebody cuts me off and I slam on the horn, in that moment, boom, I just went down to a really unhealthy place. Now I rebound pretty quickly in that moment. So I like the fact that I can see, well, as a five, when, when I'm really healthy, here's some ways I show up in the world. But when I'm unhealthy, I start to do these other things. And to build this awareness about myself of, gosh, for the last week, I've had this repeated behavior that's really not a healthy behavior. This is a little bit of a wake-up call for me. I need to, to figure out how to move to a healthier place. What are some changes that I need to make? So it is very holistic. And, and does include those levels of health, mm -hmm. which again, just for me has helped me recognize when have I been in a bad place for too long? Because it, it is one thing to say, today was just a rough day. I just had to power through today. Yep. It's another thing to say for a week or a month or six months, I've allowed myself to be in an unhealthy place and I need to find a way to navigate out of that. Hmm. Interesting. So... What is it that you like about the Enneagram so much? What is it that has you, gets you excited? You've done a lot of research. Yeah. What is it that hooked you on it? Besides, yeah. um, and by the way, you might want to specify for the audience who Ian Crone is. I, I happen to know who that is, but it, you know, you mentioned him, mentioned him earlier. Yeah, yeah. So Ian is, I would consider to be probably one of the top five Enneagram experts in the U.S., um, has written several books, has a wonderful podcast called Typology. And so if you're somebody that enjoys podcasts and just wants to listen and learn, um, he has been an incredible resource for me. Usually if I'm out taking a walk, I'm listening to one of his episodes and, and learning about, continuing to learn about the Enneagram. But I think one of the things I like about it, so again, imagine those nine numbers kind of on a circle we can break it down into three categories. So we have people that are considered to be heart centered, people that are head centered and people that are body centered. So numbers two, three, and four are heart centered. That's kind of their go-to. What, what am I feeling? What are, where am I, where's my heart at? By the numbers way, Molly, I just want to share with you as you're going through this, I've got my report up right. And I took one that I took one of the, I believe it's one of the good ones. Uh-huh. So I, as you're saying this, I'm like looking at my, I'm, I'm literally looking at mine right now and I'm okay. pretty sure where I'm going to land. So okay. continue. Numbers five, six, and seven are head centered. Numbers eight, nine, and 10 are body centered. And so just e even if that's all I know 
about the Enneagram, that helps me understand how people are going to respond or navigate the world. So if I'm working with someone that I know is a two, three, or four, I know their default is their heart. That's their center of gravity. And you've gotten to know me well enough to know my head is my center of gravity. That's, 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 where, that's where the gold is for me. And it's interesting to me, as someone who is head-centered, how often someone will say to me, you just need to get out of your head. You need to get out of your head and into your heart. And it's usually someone who's heart centered who says that to me yeah. because that's where the gold is for them. That's right. where all the magic is. And, and they want me to have that same experience. So they're like, just get out of your head and come join us. Come join the heart centered people. And there have been times in my life where that's created tension for me because it's essentially asking me to speak a language that isn't my native language. Right. I can be heart centered. I can be body centered. Like, because we all have all nine numbers in us. One is just a dominant number for us. But it's almost like saying to me, "I need you to have this conversation in Spanish." It's going to be very limited. Like, <laughs> I, I can help us find the bathroom, but that's that's about it. And so, when when a heart centered person says to me, "I just need you to get out of your head and just just go to your heart," I'm limited in what that conversation is going to look like. So uh, it was I, um, Sorry, um, can I get a, can I ask a question here? Mm -hmm. What does, I understand the head and the heart. What does body mean? Yeah. So those are people with a pretty high sense of intuition. Um, it's more of a, a visceral experience for them. They feel it in their bodies. One of the things that I notice about body centered people is how much getting outside, moving their bodies, going on hikes, um, those people tend to be the ones that say like, oh, I went out in the wilderness for a week and I hiked over a hundred miles and all my greatest ideas just came pouring out of me. It's that sense of intuition that's in their body. They are out moving and, and that's where they do their best processing. And remind me, which, what's the body? Which one's body? Eight, nine, and one. Eight, nine, and one. Because mm -hmm. I really identify with what you're saying about body yep. and it. Uh, my number three ranking is eight. Yep. So that makes sense. And then yep. my one is my one is low. Okay. So that so what I'm taking from all this, Molly, is when you meet somebody, all you have really have to do is say, "Hey, <laughs> what's your enneagram? What's you your number? <laughs> what's your number?" And then you have to translate in your head: Is this person a mind, a body, <laughs> or a heart person? And then you have to go and. So this is really simple. You did you just you just use this on the fly. Really simple. Really simple. Yeah. We yeah. I, the wings yet. No, we haven't even got we haven't even done like an overview of each of the numbers yet. So we, we've got lots to dive into. But yeah, I, I feel like if that's all I know about someone is are they head, heart, or body, that alone helps me navigate things with that person. Because when I'm with another head-centered person, we are off and we're speaking the same language. We're off and running. When it's a heart-centered person or a body-centered person, I'm just thinking, how do I set them up for success? How do I let them be at their best? Where can I meet them in the middle? Um, because I want people to be able to speak the language that makes the most sense to them. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It's so deep. much it's, it's a lot of There's a lot of stuff here. Yes, for sure. So what do we... Let's, let's put it, let's put it on the clock. Let's take one minute per type. Mm, and it's okay. the time you can just run down for us, each of the types and maybe the title and a, just a little bit about what each of those types means. Sure. So what's interesting about the Enneagram is that since it's open source, there's all, everybody has kind of staked a different claim to some of the language. So I'll, I'll use Maybe language from different people, but it's the language that makes the most sense to me. So number one. Hey, Molly, um, really quick. Could you just get into your heart and like from your heart, give us the one that most resonates? You're like, I no, No. No. You're no. like, I'm going to think about this. I'm going to give it to you from my head. Yes, just feel, please. Molly. Just just speak. All the, gold. Uh, All the gold. All the gold. It's right here. All right from, here. From your head centered. Head That's centered. Right. Type. What do you got right. for us? So number one. Um, a lot of people call that the reformer. Mm -hmm. um, some people call it the perfectionist, but there's a little kind of tension with the word perfectionist. I think we're setting yeah. people up uh, for maybe a scenario that they're not in. So 
I, I tend to have a lot of ones in my life, mm. seem to kind of gravitate to my space. Um, but ones are often looking for what's the right way to do this. How can we do this better? Um, I love planning events with ones because they're they're not looking to just get by. They, they've got a pretty high internal standard for how things should be done and how they show up in the world. One of the things I've learned about ones is part of that drive to, to perform at a high level comes from a pretty harsh inner critic. So when I'm working with a one and we're maybe, maybe we're doing an after event assessment, the last thing I need to say to the one is, let me tell you the 10 things I think didn't go well, because that one has already had that conversation with themselves 50 times. And the list is probably 50 things, not 10 things. And they're probably so, going to swear more at themselves than you'll swear at them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so even with my friends that are ones, I just look to dial down any sort of criticism or pointing out flaws because they've already noticed that and, mm -hmm. and they've heard it in their head a hundred times. So me coming along and amplifying that inner criticism doesn't help one bit. In those moments, I'm trying to reinforce the things that went well, trying to find solutions um, because they do want to raise the standard. And so it wouldn't be helpful for me to say, don't worry about it, but rather let's, yeah, let's figure out a path. Let's figure out how we can make this better so that you feel good about it. And so again, ones are body centered. So then we have twos. Twos are often called the helper incredibly heart-centered. Um, a lot of twos are therapists, counselors um, in the helping profession, just thinking about how do I, how do I show up? How do, how do I make a difference in the world? How do I help people? One of the things that is interesting about twos is as we talk about the levels of health, when a two is unhealthy, they will show up to help you, but there's an agenda behind it. So, you know, Jason, it's your hour of need. I have showed up as a heart-centered two to help you, but, but I'm really doing it because I hope that tomorrow when I have a crisis that you're going to return the favor. So healthy twos are showing up to just show up because it feels like the right thing to do. Unhealthy twos can slide into a space of, but what about me? Like mm -hmm. I helped you, but what about me? What's the return on that? And again, twos are heart-centered. Heart -centered. Threes are considered the achiever, also heart-centered. Um, a lot of celebrities tend to be threes because one of the characteristics of a three is they tend to walk into a room and think, who do I have to be to fit in with these people? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a shape shifting that happens with threes. So if you're an actor or actress, that's a great, that's a great place for you to be in because yeah. you're always playing a different character. Yeah. So again, as we think about health and unhealth with a three in an unhealthy space, it can, it can feel like, I don't know who the real you is because you're always changing to fit in, in a different space. So again, imagine you discover you're a three, you think achiever, this is awesome. I can fit it in so many different circles and I can, I can adapt. And then you think about, oh, but then people don't know the real me. Like I can imagine for a three, that's the moment that you feel like you just got punched in the chest of, yeah, there's all this great stuff about a three, but Ah, I really want people to know who I am, who my authentic self is. Yeah. Um, three is tied through the assessment that I took. It's tied for my number three. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, number four, the ind often called the individualist, um, deeply heart-centered as well. A lot of poets, artists, writers tend to be four fours, there's almost a sense with fours that my emotions are deeper than anyone else's emotions and no one feels the way that I feel. There's a, um, a sense of the world. Will I ever find my place? Will I ever find my people? Again, great for poets, artists, yes. writers, painters who can express that emotion at a really deep level. Um, and, and, you know, I, I realize I'm talking about 
occupations being associated with some of these numbers. Certainly yeah. because you're a poet doesn't make you a four, but right. we can see how knowing kind of how you navigate the world might influence the things that you're drawn to. Yeah. So then we shift to fives. Hold on a minute, Molly. Yes. My number four. Mm-hmm. All the way in the basement. <laughs> no, all the way. I'm okay. like, I'm like poet. Nope. Artist. Nope. <laughs> Extremely heart centered. Eh, nope. There you um, go. Like if you look at my, I'm looking at my score. I have a two mm-hmm. for that one. So it's, okay. it is my bottom of the barrel by, okay. by quite a bit. We can probably cross that one off the list. We can probably cross you. off the individualist for me. Yeah, okay. I think it's fair to say that is not my Enneagram type. Yeah. So number five, now we shift into the head centered people. That is where I am at. Number five is absolutely me. Um, five. So that's your number. That's your top one is that number five. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when I took it five, one and eight kind of set themselves apart from the pack. But once I read the five description, it was over. Like, just don't argue with it. Just go with it, Molly. You're a five. Uh, fives are head centered, often called the investigator or the observer. I like observer a little bit better because I feel like that's how I navigate the world. It's almost like when I'm in a group setting, I zoom out and I just want to take it all in. So imagine if we were at a, a theater watching a, a musical or a play, I want to be in the balcony but not the behind balcony. I want the side balcony that only has like two seats. Yeah. So it's just me and maybe one other person, or maybe the seat is empty. That's fine as well. And I want to be able to take it all in. I want to observe all of that. So fives are known for doing a deep dive on something that they get interested in. And, and so the Enneagram is a perfect example. I've read all the books. I've listened to all the podcasts because it was something I was interested in. So, so fives again, are that head centered group sixes, uh, often called the loyalist again, head centered. There's a a little bit for sixes, uh, of what could be a fear component uh, of thinking about what could go wrong in this situation. Um, I have a good friend who's a six and we call him the safety monitor. And he's always the one that's thinking about, are we okay? Do we have enough gas? Do we pack the life jackets? Are we going to be all right? Um, they're super responsible, but in an unhealthy place that can become more like anxiety. And so you can, you can imagine like a healthy six is like, I got this, I'm responsible. An unhealthy six starts to think what could go wrong. It it could all fall apart. And so that becomes an anxious part for them. That's my number two. Yes. And I have some theories on why uh, we'll we'll circle back to that. Yes. Uh, Sevens, the enthusiasts. So I once heard uh, Suzanne Stabile, talk up, who I would also consider to be an Enneagram expert in the U.S., and she's co-written a book with Ian Cron. Um, she was talking about sevens, and I and I couldn't quite, I didn't know a lot of sevens at that stage in my life, and I was having a hard time understanding, like, what does a seven look like? And she said, imagine that you have this meter that goes from up to down. And she said, imagine that that's emotion. So you've got like really happy and then it goes all the way down to maybe really sad. She said, sevens want to live like right here. They don't want that full range. Sevens are often thinking about what looks fun, what looks exciting. Um, I have a best friend now who's a seven. I love vacationing with her because I don't have to make any plants. She's like, boat, let's go get a boat. Sea do, let's go get a sea do. I'm like, great, great. I'll just tag along and you just tell me the fun stuff that you want to do. So sevens tend to have a lot of energy. The, the descriptor of being an enthusiast makes a lot of sense to me around sevens. Uh, the unhealthy side of sevens can often be that they only want to do the fun stuff and that they don't want to deal with some of the other emotions or feelings that are underlying. And so when some tension or something difficult in life surfaces, instead of saying, let's deal with this, it's what's the next fun thing I could do and avoid having to deal with what I need to deal with. Eights, we shift back in. Yes. That resonates. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's I'm a, I'm a seven. Um, but scale by far. 
everything you just said, but this is like my version of the five. I'm like, yep. I like to live up here. I have a lot of energy and I'm always looking at for fun and excitement. Yep. And if I'm not feeling it, I'm not in a good place. Yep. And then I figure out how I can get back into that place. Yep. Okay. We're, we're, narr- we're narrowing some things down for you. Narrowing like some it. things down. <laughs> uh, eight, um, sometimes called the challenger, sometimes called the protector. Um, eight are fascinating to me. Um, I have several good friends who are eights, and I have witnessed eights in a really healthy place, and I've witnessed eights in a really unhealthy place. Eights tend to gravitate towards issues of justice and they can't hold back when they see an injustice. So eights make great lawyers or advocates. Um, Eights are that person that's going to speak up when, when everyone knows somebody needs to say something, the eights will say it without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. They're, they're all in on confronting an injustice in the world So when they're healthy, they're great. When they're unhealthy, my experience has been they see everything as an injustice and want to fight everything. (laughs) And so it's helping sometimes an eight say, I know that you get a little bit of a, a rush, a hit off of fighting an injustice. It's not the same with just fighting. Like you you need to fight your injustice. You need to channel your voice, channel your passion over systemic racism, not over what we're having for dinner tonight. Like those are two different worlds. So channel that energy towards a real issue of justice that you feel passionate about and not confuse that with, I just feel good when I fight people. Yeah. And I've seen eights slide into that. And, yeah. and I've had those conversations with eights of you're acting like an unhealthy eight right now. <laughs> you're fighting That's everything. That's yes, nice, you're such an unhealthy eight right now. That's, a, that's such a polite way to say you're, you're really being a prick right now. You got exactly you gotta dial, it back, dial it back, my friend. Dial it back. Dial it back. Uh, and then the nines, uh, the peacemakers, nines, I find to be delightful people. They're all about the peace, they're all about connecting people. Um, the unhealthy side. Uh, of nines can be that they want to avoid conflict. They want peace so much that they just don't want to deal with the conflict. But as I look at kind of how different numbers fit together, I really enjoy being around nines. There's a calming presence for me. In fact, I would say some of my friends who are nines, it's where I feel a little less dependent on my knowledge or research or information. It's almost like I can just relax a little bit and do what maybe the twos, threes, and fours want me to do and get out of my head a little bit. But with nines, I I feel that peaceful sense with them for sure. Mm. So that's a very brief overview yeah. of each of those numbers. Yeah. And I just want to say, um, and this kind of leads me to my next question. So it's pretty clear for those who are listening, who have taken this, you probably know this, but if you haven't, I'm looking at my report, it's 22 pages and each of my types has, it has uh, how to recognize it, Mm -hmm. relationship issues, type compatibility, at my best, at my worst, it's got these things called wings, which I think we're going to talk about. It's a lot here. A lot. Where do do I go when when I'm held, what other styles do I, um, types do I go to at my best? And then I'm looking here at the, at the nine different levels. Uh-huh. Um, so I just, I actually want to read you. Um, I just want to read this to the, to you and to the audience for, um, for my, for type seven, my level nine, which is considered the unhealthiest level for me. Finally, their energy and health is completely spent, become claustrophobic and panic stricken. Often give up on themselves in life, deep depression and despair, self-destructive overdoses, impulsive suicide, generally corresponds to the bipolar disorder and histrionic personality disorder. Wow, that's dark. Isn't it? That's dark. And I'm my and my assertion, my assertion is that each of these, um, Mm -hmm. each of these, each of these nine types has a level nine that's something along the lines. And this is where you actually need therapeutic support. If you're like in this place. Right. You're going to see a therapist, you're going to the doctor, you're, you're getting help. Right. For sure. 
Yeah. I'm going to pause for one second. Okay. Our smoke alarm's going off, so hang tight for one okay. second. Okay. Okay, Molly, I'm back. I think the crisis has been averted. All right. No, no fires I can see. Okay, um, good. And, and I would probably go into level nine. Oh, wait, still beeping. I'll be right back. One second. Okay. Hey, we are back. All right. When in doubt, take the battery out. <laughs> Sometimes we just need to reset. Just it need works. to reset, whether it be a smoke detector or our Enneagram types, whatever it might be. Yes, it works with people. It works with technology. Yeah, exactly. So what's next, Molly? What are we going okay, so like to talk about next? Let's just touch on the idea of wings, because that's probably going to come up for anybody who's maybe diving into the, the Enneagram for the first time. So. Again, imagine the nine numbers around a circle and know that we all have all nine numbers in us, but one feels like home. I often describe this as imagine you're on a baseball team. You could play any position, but there's one position that you feel like shortstop is for me. That's, that's my best position. So you have a number that feels like this is most like me. To the left and the right of that number, are what are considered your wings. And one of those typically feels a little bit more dominant than the other. There's a lot of research that says once you get to a certain stage in life, those kind of balance each other out. They feel a little bit more equal. But one typically stands out as kind of a, a secondary skill set, if you will. It's, it's something else that's kind of close by. So if, again, if we use the baseball analogy, if you're a shortstop, you could probably play second or play third if you had to. One might feel a little bit more like, gosh, if I have to choose, it's definitely second base. Right. So, so there's just some similarities there. So I think, are you okay if I, we talk about your assessment just a little oh, I'd bit? I'd love to, yeah. So I think I remember from looking at yours, the seven surfaced pretty high for you. Seven is my high, yep. And then eight and six also surfaced pretty high for you. Yeah, uh, in order for me, and I, I should also specify that I took the Riso Hudson Enneagram Type Indicator 2.5, mm -hmm. and it's from it's from the Enneagram Institute. My Which understanding highly, is this, this, is a, this is a good one. It's yes. a high level of credibility. Yes, um, I absolutely. I paid for it, you know, yep. so, it, um, so I was, uh, um, I scored a 29 on type seven, mm -hmm. a 21 on type six. Mm -hmm. And then I scored a 19 on both type eight and type three. So I okay. actually have four, four, I guess you'd say I have four in my, you know, that have kind of surfaced. Yeah. So it was interesting to me when I saw, it seems like a lot of clarity around the seven, but to see the six and the eight, I'm like, well, if you're a seven, six or eight are your wings. Those are the two so that's numbers. What wings yeah. means it's the things that come in close behind it. Got yes. It. Okay. So for me as a five, I either have a four wing or a six wing. Oh, so, so your wings are, or the numbers to the left and right of you, if you're looking at yes. the scale. Got yes. it. Okay. So it makes total sense to me oh, if you're a seven, that there's a lot of six and a lot of eight that showed up for you, because those yeah. are the two, again, if, if seven is the shortstop, then the six and the eight are the second baseman and the third baseman. 
So you could be at a stage in life where those feel pretty equal to you. Or as you read those descriptions, you might think, oh gosh, I think eight's my wing because that makes a whole lot more sense to me than the six. And the reality is you don't have to know that. Like you don't, there's no club that you have to walk around and say like, I'm a seven, it's an eight wing. It's been, I've discerned that I'm good to go. It's, like, it's, it's funny that you say that because you certainly don't have to, but I've talked to people that are like, well, I'm a seven with an eight and a six. Like that's actually the way they yes. speak about it is like yes. their wings. I don't know if that's because they like to sound smarter, if it's just the way they identify or what. Well, I think, I think it's just another layer to the Enneagram. Like, you know, you can start with just figuring out, you could start with which of those centers are you in? Like, I don't know if I'm a two, three or four, but I know I'm head centered. Great. That's a great place to start. Then you may figure out, actually, I figured out I am a three. Okay. Next layer. Can you figure out what your wings are? So there's just, there's so much depth to this assessment. And again, I I think I said at the beginning, there's so much work on us to like yeah. continue that journey. Unlike the first two assessments that we talked about that were a little bit more of, this is, this is you, you go print yeah. this out and read about it. The Enneagram really does require us to do some of our own work. Yeah. So for people listening, watching, they take the assessment, mm-hmm. they have it. The heck do I do with this thing? Right. <laughs> Right. You know, so the, the, the whole premise of our series is accelerated, accelerating what you're up to. So how do I use this information other than like, oh, that's me. What do right. I do next? Yeah. So I highly encourage the Enneagram Institute website. I, I think it was probably like 12 or $13 that you paid for that assessment. Like that, so yeah. It's not hundreds of dollars. No. Um, also, Ian Cron's website has a good resource at, as well. So I would If people are going to make the investment in the Enneagram, I would go one of those two routes. Then you're going to get this report that just like you listed kind of your ranking of numbers, but I would not look at just the top number and say, that's who I am. I would look at where's there kind of a breaking point. Like you identified, I think seven, six, eight, and three, there was kind of a breaking point there and start to read the descriptions of those three numbers. Um, What's in your report? what's in books, um, on Ian's podcast. One of the things I love is he'll have episodes that where he just brings on a seven and you can just listen to a seven talk and think about all the ways that, yeah, I'm really a lot like that person. Or in your case, you might listen to a three and say, nope, I can cross that off my list. That's definitely not in the mix. Or maybe you listen to a three and realize, yeah, that's absolutely in the mix. Actually, but to, to listen, start- I want to listen to an episode about type four. So I can be like, not me. I'm like, (laughs) nope. I want to know more because I want to interact with people like that, but it's definitely not me. It's interesting because Ian is a four. So just in listening to any of the episodes, you're going to learn a little bit about fours there. Um, so, so start to do then your own work of figuring out what really resonates for you. And then I think that next step is to start look at those levels of health. And, and identify like when I'm healthy, I look like this. When I'm unhealthy, I look like this. And then begin to think about how do you then navigate the world in a way that allows you to be your healthiest self. So for me, as someone who is head-centered, if I had to work in an environment that was highly heart-centered and I needed to be heart-centered, that would not be a healthy place for me. I need to be in a place that values that I'm thinking, that my brain is always spinning, that I'm doing research, that I want to learn, that I want to share that knowledge with others. But when I'm in a situation where it's like, just turn that off, we just want to hear from your heart. I can do that a little bit, but that's not going to be a good environment for me eight hours a day. Right. Okay. Okay. Let's see. What else do I want to know about the Enneagram? So you do a lot of work with sports teams. Yes. Is this useful when you're taking a look at the the way? Because we, and we and I'm asking for two reasons. One, just by its standalone, and two, we talked about how DISC can be very useful with yeah. sports teams. Yeah. So, how do you feel that the Enneagram fits into to how sports team sports teams could use this information? It's interesting. I would say the vast majority of people in athletics are not using the Enneagram. 
And while I am not formally using it in athletics, I, I'm not having my student athletes take it yet. Although I think that, I think that's coming for me. Yeah. What I'm doing is, you know, we have to be really careful with any assessment about typing people about totally. deciding, Oh, I know, I know Jason, I've got him all figured out. I know how I'm going to treat him, but I do start to look for some patterns. So if I'm working with a student athlete and I hear them using a lot of heart centered language, I'm going to adjust my language a little bit to try to meet them where they're at. If I get the sense that somebody might be a really body centered student athlete, maybe instead of sitting in the office and having a conversation, we're going to go for a walk around campus and talk because it's good for them to be up and moving. So, so Molly, um, I think this is, this, these are important points in my opinion Mm -hmm. around accelerating using, using these, Mm -hmm. using these Mm -hmm. tools to accelerate. So what I just heard you say is if you have somebody that you find is heart centered, let's say you're talking to a student athlete, how do you know they're heart centered? Yeah, for me, it's listening to their language, listening to what are the words that they're using. So if I say, how's your day? And they say, oh, I feel, I feel really sad today. Okay, I just heard you talk about feeling. How many times am I hearing the word feeling? How many times am I hearing you describe things in emotions versus I'm thinking this, you know, my, the, the, the student athletes that I know are very head centered are likely to answer that question with research and data and, and more of a thought process behind it. They're, they're, yeah. ta- they're speaking from their heads. So where is someone speaking from? And that's going to show up just in the language that they use and how they naturally reframe a question that I might pose for them. Yeah. Got it. And, and I think another way that there's two numbers I think let's let's touch on in athletics. So if I if if a student athlete has taken the Enneagram and can tell me that they're a one, if I start to get the sense that they're a one, me sitting down with them with their stats in front of them, talking about all the numbers of what they didn't do well in the last game does not help one bit. Yeah. Does not help one bit because yeah. they've had that conversation in their head a hundred times. So helping to shift that conversation to be more outcome oriented that allows them to think about what's the change they want to make so that they can have the outcome that they wanted versus let's have a conversation about everything that went wrong because they've already had that conversation in their head. That doesn't help one bit. The other number that I find fascinating in athletics is is the eight. Because if we grabbed my phone right now and called the first 100 coaches in my in my phone, I can guarantee if we ask the question, what's the one thing you wish you had more on your team? They would say leaders. I guarantee it. Just randomly pick a hundred coaches. They're going to say that we want more leaders. And if we unpacked that, they would say, yeah, we want the leaders who, who own the locker room. We want the people that call their teammates out that say, no, you can't go to that party. No, you broke curfew. No, that's not why we do it. We want the leaders that will own the culture of this team. Okay, so you're describing an eight to me. An mm-hmm. eight's going to do that. An eight's going to say like, uh-uh, not on this team. We don't show up late. We don't show up with our shoes untied. We don't, here's how we do things. The challenge is that eight is also going to be the one that tells the referee that he or she made the wrong call. <laughs> and so I often watch coaches have this struggle with some of their student athletes because they want the eight behavior in the locker room. They want the eight behavior within the team. They don't want the eight behavior when that eight thinks the coach has committed an injustice or an official has committed that injustice. And so we've got to be, especially when you're dealing with student athletes who are young and learning, how do I be an eight and navigate the world in a healthy way? But we're saying to them things like, you got to own the locker room. You got to speak up. You got to say when somebody does something wrong. And then game time rolls around and they do that to the officials and get a technical and are on the bench. And we're like, shut up. You had no right to say that. And they're thinking, but I, it was an injustice. It was the wrong call. And I told the official, and that's what you've told me to do. So those are the kinds of things and the kinds of ways that I'm having conversations with coaches around the Enneagram because it's fascinating to watch those moments unfold on a team. Wow, that is, I, when I was listening to that, I'm like, maybe I want to own eight. That like, I was in my very, very amateur high school sports career. I was definitely like a leader in the rock locker room and also a total prick on the field to mm. like the coaches, like 
barking, you know, I played tennis and I like lost game, you know, like, oh, there was always, there was always somebody doing something wrong that wasn't me. Mm-hmm. So, sure. that, so what I'm reading in all that is if I went to level eight or type eight and I looked at the nine levels in one of those levels near the bottom is something probably about like, yeah starting fights, being voiced, being belligerent, like yes. not taking yes. responsibility. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So Molly, as we start to wrap up for today, yeah. what else do you want people to know about the Enneagram? Yeah, I think the thing that I want them to know the most, and I've said this a few times, is just how invested you need to be in this process. It's a very different process. And as I think forward to next week, if we compare the whole Clifton Strengths process to the Enneagram, it's a very different process. Very, very different. <laughs> yeah. Very different. Um, the Enneagram really just requires a lot of your own self-discovery. And so if you're not interested in that, it's probably not a good tool for you. You're, you're probably going to say like, I paid 12 bucks and I didn't, I didn't learn anything about myself. But if you're someone that's like, I'm ready to figure out who I am. I, I want to do this hard work on myself. The Enneagram will kind of point you in a direction. It'll say, here's some stuff that surfaced for you. Now go figure it out. Um, and, and then that, the other thing I would circle back to is just know that when you figure that out, there's going to be some stuff about there that stuff about yourself that you don't like. Um, but yep. it's important. It's important to know this is what it's like to experience me. This is what it's like to be on the other side of me. And having that sense of awareness can be so transformational. Yeah. Well, that's great, Molly. I think we're going to wrap up in the interest of time today. I want to yes. thank you for giving us the Enneagram goodness. Thank um, you. To wrap up, I'd love if you would just go back again and summarize um, both the name of the podcast yeah. the and the two, if you were going to recommend that somebody goes and takes this, where would you recommend they go? Just to reframe this again. Yes. So if you're going to take it, I highly suggest the Enneagram Institute or go to Ian Cron's website. That's C-R-O-N is his last name. His podcast is called Typology. Um, I, it's as good as it gets. Uh, if you wanted to order just one book to start with, I would get his book called The Road Back to You. And then there are probably six or eight others I could suggest, but that's a good place to start um, to do that deep dive and figure out who you are and how you navigate the world. Yeah. Well, one of the things I want to leave with too is I didn't cover in my report is maybe there's people listening to this and they go, Hey, like, cool. I kind of know this about myself. It gives you a lot of really good tips about relationships, Mm -hmm. personal relationships, romantic relationships. What, how are you as a partner? Right. And so if you'd like to accelerate your romantic relationships, which who doesn't either, who, they doesn't? Want to, who doesn't, I know my wife wants me to accelerate my romantic relationships <laughs> all the time, all the time. She, and I think I know what type she is too. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we can maybe can compare this, but there's a lot of good stuff in here for personal, for yeah. personal things too. Um, including, like you said, what profession you're in, how you interact with people, what, and it, it kind of goes back to the Myers-Briggs and the disc, like what fills you up, what drains mm-hmm. you. Yeah. And having, um, for me at least, I'm a big fan of having somewhere to plant my flag as opposed mm-hmm. to just knowing this about myself. Maybe this is the head part of me. I like to yeah. be like, oh, and then I can, oh, I'm a type, I'm a type seven. I'm going to plant the flag there. And then I can look at this and go, oh yeah, there's some of my type seven stuff. Right. So just, uh, you know, to promote this to everybody listening, it's a lot of, th- this is useful information as a human, not yeah. just for work, not for just for sure. personal overall. For sure. Yep. Right, Molly. So next week we'll be back for, I can't believe we're already in our fourth one next week. It's crazy. Flying by. I feel like we might have to do this again in a couple months because it's, uh, so. <laughs> it's a ton of fun. Um, as the enthusiast, mm. I'm, I'm having a lot, I'm, this is fun and exciting for me. Good. So this is like, this is my Enneagram's like, yes. And, um, and I'm going to give you the best role next week. You get to be the investigator and ask me right. a bunch of questions about Clifton Strengths. So we're going to cover off on that. And then we're going to wrap up this series just for this time. And we'll see you all here same time next week. And if you're listening on the podcast, thanks for tuning in. We've got one more of these coming. So thank you so much. And Molly, thanks to you for all the information today. You're welcome. Thanks.